Good evening, everyone. I've been doing this for eight years now. No one, no one. Oh, gosh. Actually, more relevantly, one of us, hold on. Um, any Esperanto speakers in the audience? What, no one? Wow, OK. Um, I'm not a fluent speaker at all, but I'm interested in natural and constructed languages. Um, they facilitate communication among humans and, more recently, between humans and machines. Artificial languages like C++ are made with careful thought and consideration for the users. No, really, we do think about you at great length. No, really, we do think about you at great length. Some things are hard to encapsulate into a language, but it's in the front of our minds. But there is no point in adding something to the language if it's impossible to use. Nobody wants to invest thousands of hours of their lives for a feature that will be used by two people, likely by mistake. Similarly, uh, okay, that was my paper. It's obviously receded into folk memory now, hasn't it? Okay. It made no progress at all. Similarly, artificial human languages are constructed with a desire to improve the communications of humans. I'm learning Ukrainian at the moment. It's hard. It's hard. Three plurals. Not one, three. That are gendered. There's a plural for two, a plural for five, and a plural for many. But sometimes it's not really many. Sometimes it's like, you, you just know. You're like, you know, you know which fault to use. Um, I've been on Duolingo for about 18 months. I met a Ukrainian last week. I made an absolute useless idiot of myself in their presence. So thanks, Duolingo. Um, artificial human languages are created to be easy to learn and broad in comprehension. And there's a group called Conlang, which is short for constructed language. Um, a constructed language is a language whose phonology, grammar, orthography, and vocabulary, uh, instead of having developed naturally, are consciously devised for some purpose, which may include being devised for a work of fiction. And this is the Conlang flag. It represents the Tower of Babel against a rising sun. Um, there are a lot of constructed languages. Has anyone tried learning Valerian? Dothraki? Who said Dothraki? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Klingon. Who's learned Klingon? Come on. Wow, you can learn languages. They're fun. Cinderin. Anyone learned Cinderin? Or it's bad. No. All right. Cinderin. This is the Elvish language of Tolkien. Um, I want to look at what are called a posteriori international auxiliary languages. Um, an a posteriori language is any constructed language um, whose elements are borrowed from or based on existing languages and an international auxiliary language um, is a language meant for communication between people from different nations who do not share a common first language. And a quick tour of Wikipedia will give you an interesting list of samples on this noble goal. Um, Valerian, there we are. Uh, Dothraki, Klingon, Cinderin. Um, yes, 1868, Universal Glot. Anyone heard of this one? No. Uh, Volupik. Yes, yes. Starting to get a bit more present. Pasalingua. Honestly, artificial language study is fascinating. Esperanto. Who's heard of Esperanto? Finally. All right. Actually, Esperanto is an important one. Um, any Red Dwarf fans here? Yeah. So this was the second language used on Big Red. Crichton was an effective speaker, unlike Rimmer possibly in a nod to C-3PO. But it's the world's most widely spoken constructed international auxiliary language. Um, and it was created by a man called L.L. L. Zamenhof in 1887 uh, to be the international language. That's uh, la lingua internacia. Um, it's intended to be a universal second language for international communication. Uh, he did, oh Jesus, a minute, right. Uh, he described the language in Dr. Esperanto's international language, which he published under the pseudonym Doctoro Esperanto. Um, early adopters of the language liked the name Esperanto, it means one who hopes. Um, he just wanted to create an easy language. And it's got a steady, state sizable population of nat native speakers, about 2,000 native speakers, 100,000 speakers around the world. Why did I call this talk Dying for Your Language? Esperanto attracted the suspicion of many states. In Imperial Japan, the left wing of the Japanese Esperanto movement was forbidden. But its leaders were careful enough not to give the impression to the government that the Esperantists were socialist revolutionaries, which proved a successful strategy. In Nazi Germany, there was a motivation to ban Esperanto because Zamenhof was Jewish, and due to the internationalist nature of Esperanto, which was perceived as Bolshevist. Esperantists were killed during the Holocaust, with Zamenhof's family in particular singled out to be killed. Esperantists in German concentration camps did, however, teach Esperanto to fellow, fellow prisoners. 
telling guards they were teaching Italian, the language of one of Germany's Actis Allies. allies. But after the Re Russian Revolution of 1917, Esperanto was given a measure of government support by the new communist states. I have one more slide. In the former Russian Empire, this is the bad bit. This is what we've been building up to. The Soviet Union even, even supported it. And Stalin um, learned Esperanto. But in 1937, at the height of the Great Purge, he completely reversed his policies on Esperanto. Thousands of Esperanto speakers were executed. Quite often, the accusation was you are an active member of an international spy organization which hosts itself under the name of Association of Soviet Esperantists on the territory of the Soviet Union. We seem to live in dangerous times. I'm a European and an internationalist, and I hope I never have to die for speaking a language. Thank you.